like me ready to live our own truly epic life. I'm Julie Neal, a life and leadership coach, community builder, writer, and mom to two high energy boys who challenge me to grow into my best mom! self. a really long podcast pause and the death of my father to bring my voice back to the microphone, start recording conversations again, and hopefully bringing something that is of meaning to you through my life experience. So I really felt important to me when I first come back to the podcast to do a solo cast about the experience of losing my dad and some of the lessons I learned and an opportunity to put some closure on what was the last season. The last episode before this one that I released was such a beautiful one with my own son, Ryan, and Julie Lithcott Hames. And then there was no more. I think I released that in November. In December... I turned 50 on December 1st and had an amazing Mother's Quest five-year celebration, which my mom and my dad were both present for. I'm so grateful for that. And my dad was there for a birthday party I had in Los Angeles. And shortly after that, he had a heart attack. His health had been definitely declining. He lived as a type 1 diabetic since the time that he was in his 30s to be 84. He would have been 85 in February and he had some heart issues and he was starting to have some serious kidney issues and was going to begin the process of dialysis. But it really is quite remarkable the full and amazing life that he did live even while battling diabetes all those years. So in early December, he had a heart attack. My mom brought him into the hospital and They determined that he should try to put a stent in, something that we knew was needed, but because of his fragile body system and his kidneys, his cardiologist had been really putting off. It was kind of like, we'll let, you know, we'll only do it if you really need it. And they decided that he would go in to get the stent put in. And during that procedure, things kind of went awry. And they ended up having to put him on a ventilator because he was not stable enough. And then he was on the ventilator. Oh, goodness. I don't know the exact. I want to say it might have been like it was over a week. Might have been 10 days. And as that process continued, more and more of his body started failing. He ended up with an infection. His kidneys got worse. He never regained the ability to be conscious and come off the ventilator. And eventually it became clear that he was either not going to make it or if he ever did, he would definitely not be the same. He would probably never be able to walk and might have to live with overnight care for the rest of his life. And we ultimately made the decision to take him off the ventilator and put him on something called comfort care, where all of the life-saving measures that were being used to keep him alive were stopped. And then with my mom and I there and my family on FaceTime, which I didn't realize until afterwards, my dad did transition within about 30 minutes from the time that we took him off the ventilator and began his comfort care process. And that was on December 19th. Wow. In many ways, I feel like my life has been on pause. There's been a lot of great living happening, but also I think we've been riding waves of grief. And I think this episode for me in some ways is a bit of part of closure of this initial chapter of grieving for me. And an invitation to 
continue to love and miss my father, but also, you know, do some healing and start to move forward. So when I record episodes with guests, I usually set an intention for myself and I invite them to do the same. And I made some intentions for me that I wanted to share with you. The first one is I do not have a script. Sometimes when I do a solo cast, I write out a lot of what I'm going to say. I did write some reflections about the lessons I've learned and some of the key things I want to bring forward, but I am just going to completely speak whatever words come to me from the heart. And that will definitely mean that there'll be times that I'm going to lose my train of thought or I might cry. (laughs) And I am committed to allowing whatever needs to come out to come out in whatever way it's going to. And that definitely involves a release of trying to hold any sense of perfection, which has been a lifelong challenge for me. So there's that. Oh, there's Luna barking. Oh, I think she's chasing a squirrel. So one intention is just to speak openly from my heart with whatever feels like it's important to share. I also have an intention that I'm holding you, the listener, in my mind, that I wanted to record this for you if you've lost a loved one and you're grieving, if you are maybe where my family was in December, where you have a loved one that may be transitioning soon and you're unclear about how to move through that process, or even if you just are a person who has people you love and you know that death is a part of living and it's on the horizon and you want to look at it. You want to be part of the conversation. I think that's one of my biggest hopes for this episode is to start and inspire more conversation about death because, wow, it's one of the only things (laughs) that we know will happen for sure for ourselves and the people we love. And yet we don't talk about it. So there you go. First big tears of the of the solo cast. God, I should have brought some tissues over. I might have to pause to grab some, but we'll see how I do. So releasing perfection and speaking to you, holding you in my mind and my heart as this episode comes forward. Okay, there's a third one kind of related to the releasing perfection and speaking to you directly. I have had the amazing gift of being on a Voxer channel. Voxer is like a WhatsApp walkie talkie app where I can press record. And on the other end are several amazing members of the very first Mother's Quest virtual circle I ever created now, like over four years ago. And we have stayed connected on this Voxer channel. And I will tell you, we have talked about every aspect of life. We laugh and we cry. We're there for each other. Oh, and they were there for me through the whole process of my dad dying. And there's something amazing about Voxer in that (laughs) you press record and then you just start to talk because no one's there with you usually live. You can speak uninterrupted and get your thoughts out. But then you know that there is somebody there on the other end. So I'm going to treat this episode like I would leaving a very long Vox message (laughs) for my community, for my people. And that is just a helpful frame for me to just keep talking. So those are my intentions. I want to share one other thing that's feeling very present for me. I usually create a vision board every year in February. We say February is the new January. And this year, I think a lot because of my process of grieving, a lot of my starts to my new year didn't even start on my delayed February timeline. (laughs) So I only am just now finishing my vision board. And I love the process of cutting out all these different things from magazines, just seeing what speaks to me. And I cut out something on a page and it said, there's nothing so whole as a broken heart. And wow, did that speak to me? Um, Because I think one of the overarching lessons I'm learning about grief is how the other side of the grief coin is love. Oh, God, this is going to be harder than I thought to keep talking. 
And the other side of grief is love. And in order to be a whole human loving person, you will have times where your heart is breaking. And this is just, this is just what it means to be human. So this episode is going to be about love and it's going to be about grief. And somebody that I have, you know, learning so much from and who held so much space for me through this process is Donna Halit, who is a regenerative grief coach. She's part of my Mystics Society community. Met her through Lindsay Para, who you may have heard me talk about, or you may have heard my episode with Lindsay. I'll link to it in the show notes so you can learn more about her. But when I was moving through this process, Donna was one of the first people I thought of. Donna lost her husband years ago, and it sparked a process for her of understanding the cyclical and important nature of grief in life. And she helps me and so many other people figure out our way to to integrate grief in our life. So for this episode's dedication, I wanted to invite Donna to speak synchronistically. The partner, life partner she lost is also named David, which is my dad's name. No coincidences. And here's Donna with this episode's dedication. Hello, I'm Donna Halit, and I'm honored to dedicate this episode of the Mother's Quest podcast to my grief mentor, Saban Fusome, and to my deceased husband, David. Saban Fusome brought her community grief ritual traditions from Burkina Faso in West Africa, and I had the blessing of participating in those rituals over the course of a dozen years. This regular practice of communal grieving helped me develop a strong relationship with grief and gave me the opportunity to understand on a cellular level the cyclical, ongoing, regenerative nature of grief, which served me well when my husband died almost seven years ago. The last grief ritual I did with Sabanfu was nine months after my husband's death. It was truly one of the most powerful experiences of my life, being held in community while literally being held by a dear friend with Sabanfu drumming in the background. I'll never forget it. For me, she brought together the power of ceremony and the fundamental communal nature of grief, dispelling so many myths held by our grief phobic society. Among many lessons, I learned about the power of tears and vulnerability, that joy and grief are inextricably connected, and that grief is a cultural element that connects us all and can strengthen community. David and Sabanfu are both now ancestors. While they never met on this earthly plane, I will forever be grateful for the way they continue to weave together on my life path for their wisdom teachings and presence in my life. I now pay forward the gifts I received through my deep dive with grief and guide and support others in their process. I'm grateful to Julie for reaching out for support when her father died and I'm truly honored to have shared space with her during that very sacred time. I honor and acknowledge her courage and willingness to share about her experiences on this podcast. I hope you'll consider this podcast an invitation to consciously look at your relationship with grief, because if you love, you grieve. And I wish so much love for all of us. Thank you so much, Donna, for sharing these beautiful words, this reminder that if you love, you grieve. Oh, and for all the ways that you supported me through this process and continue to support me. You can find more information about Donna and her work in the show notes. But also, after my father died, I invited Donna to come to the Mother's Quest community and be our ambassador in the month of January. And she shared some of her resources and some of her insights, and it was really wonderful to have her hold space for us there. So if you're not yet a member of the Mother's Quest community, you can request to join at mothersquest.com slash community and put in Donna's name in the search and you'll find some of the things that she shared with us then. And I really encourage you to 
go check out her website and reach out to her. She's just such an invaluable resource and a kind, amazing coach. So thank you, Donna. So what I decided to do, I wanted to share some of the lessons that I felt I learned along the journey and that I'm still learning. And as I share the lessons, I'll weave in some of the stories of what happened for us. And I I hope that the lesson and the story together will resonate with you. I really want to encourage you to just take whatever's meaningful to you and or to make whatever meaning you want to take of your own from what you hear. So this is all just an offering for you. The first lesson I feel like I learned, actually the first two are really interesting. The first two lessons are also among the two lessons I shared in my Mother's Quest Inspiration Guide about the lessons I learned about living my epic life. So I guess it's no surprise that those lessons would be true for this transformative epic life experience as well. The first one is to look for signs and to make meaning of it. I think, you know, when you find yourself in a situation like moving through the death of a loved one or anything else that is hard and can be filled with grief or where you don't know what the next step is, if you can keep your eyes open to what speaks to you and then you can pause it long enough to make some meaning of it, I think these things can become your own internal compass. For me, I kept seeing things that felt so meaningful and that became almost like a theme for us around my father's death. So the first one, I came down to LA from the Bay Area where I live to be with my mom and support her and to sit with my dad. And while I came, I missed my youngest son Jacob's holiday recital at school. It was a a performance and a show. And so I remember sitting in the hospital lounge downstairs on a bench with my computer on Zoom and watching Jake and his class on stage performing a dance to a song that they were sort of lip syncing. (laughs) And it was the Beatles song, Here Comes the Sun. And I just knew I had chills and from head to toe, I just knew that that song mattered. First of all, it's like this beautiful, uplifting song that helps you remember that there will be sunshine on the other side of hard things. It reminded me of the power of music, which is something that my father loved. My son Ryan reminded me that my dad, apparently when he was younger, was told that he needed to be at the back of the choir because he didn't have a good voice. And so in defiance, the rest of his life, he would be humming and singing all the time. He loved show tunes. He loved, you know, like kind of a random assortment of songs. And often he got the words wrong, but he was always, always singing and humming. And so when I heard that song, I just thought, yeah, like music is important right now. And the other thing is my dad loved sunshine. So he grew up in New York. There's a a powerful story about fate, which he tells in the podcast episode I recorded with him, which was such a gift to have about a day when he saw an ad for a job in California and he was getting ready to go home and the elevator doors opened. And instead of getting in and letting them close and going home, he let the doors close, walked back into his office and typed out a resume, sent it, and then ended up getting this job and moving his family to California and the rest is history. But part of what was calling him to California was the sunshine, which he loved so much. I have so many images of my dad, like sitting outside with the sun on his face. And so the idea of bringing in music and the idea of this sunshine as a metaphor and having your face in the sun became really important for us and was a thread that carried through, like even when we did his celebration of life, I chose this yellow image from the Evite options and a picture of my dad from his younger days sitting outside in Palm Springs with this newspaper in the sunshine. And there were many moments where I wasn't sure what to say to my dad. We believed he could hear us even though he wasn't conscious. And I would remind him of, you know, imagine you're in your happy place. Imagine you have the sun shining on your face. So I was so grateful for that sign. 
Another sign, uh, there's a lot of the uh, Lindsay Para mystic in this story. I have the Mystics Almanac, which is basically um, Lindsay and Sarah Love and a team of people she pulls together. They draw from the Mystics Almanac deck, Oracle deck. They draw cards for each day and they do this the entire year before. And so they have no idea. Well, I guess they're drawn by something, but, you know, looking back, it's all forward, forward imagining what cards may have meaning on each day. Well, for some reason, I grabbed the almanac when I went to visit and I ended up opening it and each card surrounding my dad's death, the day before he died, the day he died and the day after were so resonant and meaningful and really helpful. So I'm actually going to read to you the transformation card, which was the card that showed up the day before my dad died and also became a sign and a metaphor. I think, wow, you know, none of us really know what happens in death, but I think that since it's such a mystery, if we can hold the possibility of something positive and transformative on the other side, it can bring comfort, hopefully maybe to the person who's getting ready to transition and to those of us who are surrounding them. So this card was the transformation card number 13. And I will read it to you and tell you a little bit about how that then became helpful to us. Goodness, I have to now take my glasses off so I can see up close. (laughs) Transformation, guidance, allow yourself to adapt and change. What if the butterfly had tried to stay a caterpillar? Imagine the struggle, angst, and grief. Instead, the caterpillar follows its original instructions to weave a cocoon, go inside, surrender itself to the mush that is the wise imago or imago cell, and be transformed to emerge as a glorious butterfly. The caterpillar may not know what it will become, but it instinctively knows the next right step. When you follow the next aligned step before you, Transformation can be as gentle and natural as the butterfly's journey. It is in resistance to transformation that you invite pain, fatigue, and grief. That is not to say there is no grief in the stage. Turning to mush and surrendering to the not knowing is edgy. When you see the signs that transformation is afoot, however, try your hand at letting go and allowing shift. Loosen your grip. Allow the molecules to move and change. When you stir things up, you create room for change. Transformation isn't always easy, but it is a potent and powerful way to align yourself to your true nature. So I read this and felt like, wow, what a metaphor a caterpillar turning into a butterfly might be for us about death. The the spinning yourself into a cocoon And being in this interim stage where you're having to let go of everything that was and trusting and hoping that something emerges on the other side. But there's the not knowing. So this metaphor and the card allowed me to be in the transition of not knowing, but to imagine something beautiful that could be possible on the other side. And I read this card to my dad. I read it to him the day that he died as well. And also the card of that day, which was equally beautiful and fitting. And even my mom, who I think, you know, doesn't, doesn't really believe that something happens on the other side of death. I just invited her to hold the possibility and it it brought us some comfort. So I'll invite you in your life. And certainly if you're in the process of transitioning with somebody who's grieving or even possibly transitioning yourself to look for signs around you and to make meaning of them and to find comfort where you can in them. That's the first lesson. The second lesson is to find your guides. So the C in EPIC stands for connected to a strong support network. And this is a reminder that we do not need to be on this journey alone. And one of the things that I think is the gift of mine that I think really supported my family is my ability to seek and find people that may be helpful to us. 
or when people are there in front of you to open yourself to them. So earlier on in the process, when we did not know if my dad was going to make it or not, we didn't know what to say to him while he was on the ventilator. I reached out to Rabbi Carla Howard of Jewish Hospice Care. She considers herself a death doula, and I learned about that term. And I was a little worried at first to introduce her to my mom and my sisters because you know, she helps people who are dying. And we did not know if my dad was dying and we hoped he would not be. But at the same time, I knew that she had something that she could bring to us. And so we set up a Zoom call. And on that call, you know, we said, we're not sure what to tell him. (laughs) And she asked us some really powerful questions that were so helpful. She said, well, what did your dad believe? Like, what was helpful to your father during his life? Did he have any perspectives that he leaned into. And my dad believed in fate. And that just immediately came to us. And then she said, okay, but so what did that mean for him? What did it mean for him to believe in fate? And I said, well, I think it meant that he learned to trust himself, that he trusted his intuition. And, you know, that example I shared earlier about the elevator doors opening, he felt something inside telling him that he should respond to that job advertisement. And he listened to himself. So for a number of days when we weren't really weren't sure what was going to happen, we reminded my dad to trust himself and um, to trust his body, to know that his body knew what it needed to do. And maybe that might meant healing and becoming conscious. And maybe that might mean moving him on the path to transitioning to his death but to remind him of that perspective. I was so grateful to her for that. There were other guides. I mentioned I reached out to Donna. One of the things she told me is, again, about this issue of trusting myself. That as human beings, you know, she shared some of the learnings from her mentor who she talked about in the dedication. But as human beings, we want to like turn to the guidebook, page whatever, that tells us exactly what we should do. And she reminded me that I can be my own ceremony and that I could trust myself. We had the ER doctor was this really thoughtful, zen-like man. And I remember we met with him once in the conference room where he was like, okay, I think it's time to talk a little bit about what might be next and the possibility of putting my dad on comfort care. And he had two really wise things to share. Number one, he told us what he thought the quality of life would be for our father if he even were to make it through, which was a huge if. And he asked us what our dad valued. What was the kind of life that we know that he likes to live? And my dad had already been not living life to his fullest. He loves to be on the golf course and to be among his grandchildren. And he was having trouble seeing and hearing. And if he couldn't be out living his life on the golf course with his family, being able to be a part of our lives, he would not want to be living. I don't, we didn't think, we really didn't think. And so that helped guide our decision making, even though it felt hard to imagine putting him on comfort care and turning the ventilator off, that we we knew that he wouldn't want to be living that way. So that was really helpful to listen to him, the ER doctor, to guide us through that, thinking about what our father would want for his life. And then the other thing is he told us about ways to say goodbye and the importance of that. He told us some of the most powerful things could be to say, I'm sorry for, I forgive you for, and I love you and share the things that you love about the person. And so, you know, we had the opportunity for every child and grandchild to come up and sit next to my father in in his hospital room. And I was able to guide some of them who wanted to through that process. And I'm thinking particularly of my son, Jacob, who's now nine, was nine at the time too. It was so sweet to see him hold my dad's hand and just so authentically, meaningfully say to his grandfather, you know, I'm sorry that 
sometimes you bugged me (laughs) and, you know, I didn't always want to talk to you or let you squeeze my hand and I forgive you for being annoying (laughs) and I, I love you for taking me for golf cart rides and going fishing for balls and just that framework and that opportunity was really important. That brings me <laughs> that brings me to another lesson about the importance of saying goodbye. I think it's really important to do what feels right for you and saying goodbye can feel so painful, but I also believe that closure can be healing. So, I would encourage you to think about what's a meaningful way to find some closure for you. For us, it was allowing every grandchild to come and sit with my dad and for some of them to move through that process and for us to be able to say anything we felt like might be left unsaid. It may be different for you, but I encourage you to find what feels meaningful to you. And that brings me to lesson four, lean into rituals, or you can make your own. So we're Jewish, and even though my dad was not necessarily a religious person, even though he wasn't necessarily a religious person, I did think that he would find some comfort in some of the Jewish rituals. For sure, it brought me comfort because I feel spiritually connected to Judaism. And I think even my other family members who are in different ways connected or not connected found some comfort, but we really made it our own. So there's a Jewish prayer, the Misha Berach, and there were really beautiful moments where like my cantor called to check in on me, Alana, Alana Jagoda, and I asked if she would sing the prayer with us, and I put her on speaker, and, and she sang it with me and my mom, and my aunt happened to be on the phone too, and so she got to be part of that. After we took my dad off comfort care, I trusted myself. This is back to like, we can be our own ceremony. I had this idea that we should make a playlist for my dad because music was so important. And so my nephew, Josh, put it together, but we all contributed songs. We put some songs on there, like my dad would always sing, How Much Is That Doggy in the Window? Or he would always sing, Que Sera Sera, which also seemed like a theme about trusting fate. And so then, you know, after we took my dad off the ventilator, we used the playlist as this grounding thing we could it was like an anchor we would play the different songs and then man we were on spotify and at one point a commercial came on (laughs) and i i remember being like oh sorry dad should have paid for premium and then there was like this all this laughter in the background and that's when i realized that my whole family was also watching what was happening on facetime which i had not been aware of before but you know, having the playlist and having the Jewish prayer. And we invited a Jewish rabbi to come in to the room earlier. And then I hired somebody called a shomer, which is kind of ancient, traditional Jewish role of somebody who meets the body at the mortuary when it arrives and stays with that soul. It's usually until the body is then buried we chose to do cremation for my dad. So I had a shomer with the body initially when it first came to the mortuary. And then I paid for the shomer to come again the day before my dad was cremated to guard the body and to keep the soul company. And the shomer reads Psalms and says all kinds of prayers. And it just felt right for me to tap into that, that ritual. We lit the yard site candle for a certain number of days. And, you know, we ended up putting like golf balls in a picture next to the candle. (laughs) Like we just, we tapped into the things that felt meaningful to us, but then we made them our own. And the things that felt like they would not be helpful, we didn't feel like we had to hold on to those either. So lean into rituals, maybe from your culture or your family but also don't be afraid to release those if they don't feel right for you and invite yourself to make your own. Lesson number five, let laughter in. So 
there will be moments, I hope, (laughs) where you find yourself laughing at the most unusual opportunity. And I encourage you to lean in to the laughter. It is medicine. It's so helpful. I mentioned that I hired the Shomer and I asked the Shomer to call me from the mortuary um, so I could tell him about my dad. So he knew a little bit about this body that he was watching over. So the Shomer calls and says, okay, yes, I'm here with your dad. And I tell him all these stories. My dad loved to golf. He had three daughters. He loved the sunshine. If you could remind him to look up at the sun. And then the next day, my mom and my sisters and I arrive at the mortuary to try to make plans for what to do. And the the person at the mortuary says, I'm really sorry to tell you this, but we have not been able to get your dad's body from the hospital. We don't know what's going on, but they haven't released the body to us. And I say, oh, no, no, that's impossible. I spoke to the Shomer yesterday and he was with my dad's body. And she said, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry to tell you this, but... The Shomer was actually with the wrong body. (laughs) And of course, okay, maybe that's not a great thing that that happened, but it was really hard not to laugh. And, you know, before we knew it, my mom and my sisters and I were hysterically laughing. And, you know, we ended up laughing about other things like, you know, you have to make these decisions about what do you put the ashes in and was the thing big enough and I think the person at the mortuary maybe was surprised because it might not be the the thing she typically finds, but we just found ourselves in stitches. Like there were so many moments where we couldn't, we were like crying from laughing. And eventually while we were there, my dad's body arrived. So we were able to then have the Shomer stay and be with his body during that time. But there was also a gift in the mishap. So because of COVID, Only one or two of us were ever allowed to be by my father's side, but now here we were at the mortuary and my dad's body was there. And we ended up asking if we could see him and they prepared him. He was no longer hooked up to machines. Um, He was looked very peaceful. My mom and my sisters and I were able to surround him. And, you know, we went from the laughter and the levity of the mishap to the gift of being able to, you know, be with my father's physical body as a family, as the originals, as we would call them. So let laughter in and invite the things that you don't expect. Invite the possibility that there might be a gift in them. That brings me to lesson number six, release perfectionism and shame. Ooh, so. The day that my dad died, I knew I wanted to be there. And I experienced a way of being in myself that I've never experienced before. It felt to me like I was the least connected to my ego or to a perception of what other people were thinking of me. And I just trusted my instinct and did what I felt was important in the moment. I did not realize that my family was watching, including my two sons who saw me in this role of being there by my father through the transition of his death, which I think in the end was a blessing and a rare experience, but I wasn't aware of it. And so I'm grateful that in that day, I didn't care what I looked like. I didn't care what I sounded like. I just was trying to show up in the fullest part of who I could be. But then the next day, I felt some shame. I think I had like a vulnerability hangover at realizing that I was being, that I was observed. I think I felt like I had shepherded my dad to his death. And that felt hard because, you know, I definitely said things to him like, we love you and we'll be okay and everything's taken care of and it's okay to let go. And that was really hard. It was really hard to do. You know, when we made the decision to take him off of life support. So I'd say this lesson of the releasing perfectionism and shame is one that I'm still in the midst of. (laughs) And such a lesson that I'm trying to take on in life in general. But it's actually feeling really good that I'm just showing up and sharing what's coming to my mind in this episode. 
I think it's part of my healing around this. So no, there is no right. There's no 100% right. I'm sure there are things that you may do that may bring comfort and there might be mistakes or things that may not feel good to somebody and it's all okay. And just give yourself grace and release, release, release any sense that there is anything that will be perfect. Okay. That brings me to lesson number seven, open your heart and ride the waves. So I do feel like in being very strong the day that my dad died, I think there were some ways that I cut off my emotion and the ability for me to also show up as someone who was grieving. It took me like weeks before I even had like a big cry. And I think I'm still trying to fully feel and release. And what I'm learning is that grief just comes in waves. And when I can, I try to open myself to it. We were in Monterey sometime in January, and I was outside looking up at the full moon, and I all of a sudden just felt over completely full with memories of my dad. And I allowed myself to like take myself on a mental, it was almost like a slideshow of all of the moments, all of the different versions of my dad. Because that's the other interesting thing is that you don't only grieve the person who's currently in your life, but then you start to remember all these other phases of who this person was. So I encourage you to open your heart while you're in the process to remember to take care of yourself and to allow yourself to feel your emotions, which I think I could have probably done a better job of myself. But I also invite you to keep your heart open whenever the moment takes you. I think my sister Karen will be okay with me telling you this. She had the same thing where she'd be like, I don't know why I'm fine. Like I'm just I'm going to work and I'm doing all my stuff. And then she would say she'd be like crying in the shower or We were in the kitchen together as a family. And the next thing I knew, like she was on the floor of her kitchen crying. And I just sat down next to her and just held space for her to feel her feelings in that moment. So just know (laughs) it doesn't just happen in your period of grieving that you set for yourself. It's just going to be an ongoing process. I think that's why Donna calls it like it's a regenerative process because I do think that if we could keep our hearts open and allow ourselves to make meaning and take in new lessons all the time about the experience, I think it will help us live a fuller life. (sighs) Okay, tissue break. Okay, I am at lesson eight and there are only eight lessons. It's a weird number, but I'm not going for perfect. That's what came to me. Lesson number eight is have the conversations. So I really wish we had encouraged my dad to have conversations about dying. We knew that his health was failing. We all know we're going to die someday. (laughs) And we didn't really know, like, I don't really know what my dad wanted as he was dying. I thought that being surrounded by me and my mom and having music, that that would be comforting. But in truth, I don't know. Maybe he wanted privacy. And, you know, I think we'll also maybe never know exactly what we're feeling in the moment. And it's also important to let the loved ones around you do what feels right for them. It's complicated. But I think as much as we have conversations and start to look at not only the process of dying, but also what comes after. You know, I think there was a lot that could have been put in place that would have really helped make things easier for my mom in her transition. So I encourage you to have the conversations about death and dying. Have them at any point in your life. And that actually brings me to the challenge that I want to offer myself and to you. Most of my episodes always end with a challenge, usually from my guest. But my challenge is say yes to talking about death and dying. My friend Orly told me about something called death over dinner. 
And I'm going to put the link in the show notes for you. And I'm going to pursue following their format because they've thought thoughtfully about how how to help people have these conversations. I'm going to invite some of my close friends to come over and have dinner and have us talk about this. I think it's a gift for ourselves, but it's a gift for our loved ones. And it's really important. I think death is like one of the most important conversations we can have about something that is absolutely unifying that we know that is going to touch every single one of us in multiple ways. I also really want to encourage you to have meaningful conversations with the people you love and especially your family. I am so grateful that I had recorded a podcast with my dad. It has brought so much comfort to me, and I'm so grateful that his stories and his wisdom are recorded. So say yes to having conversations about death and dying, but also say yes to having conversations with the people that matter to you about the things that matter. Don't wait. Don't feel like it has to be perfect. I absolutely would want to make myself available to you if you wanted me to work with you to help you think about how to have or record meaningful conversations. Reach out to me, but also trust yourself. There's no getting this wrong. Have multiple conversations, (laughs) but just make sure that you make the space to have them. So I made it through. Yay. I did cry, but I didn't cry maybe as much as I thought I would. And I feel like I've shared a lot of the truths. I just want to leave you with this one other important lesson that I'm continuing to learn about the importance of life as the journey. It's not the destination that matters most. It's really our process along the way our ability to be present, to love our people. I'm thinking about the Mother's Quest mantra, which will come soon, which was inspired by the death of my friend, Leslie. You know, seize the day. You do not know (laughs) when your life is coming to an end or when the life of someone you love is coming to an end. Every day, tell the people you love that you love them and be present to to the gifts that are all around you. The second part of the mantra is honor your gifts. There's so much that you have that nobody else can bring forward. Never thought I'd be a podcaster, but here I am today using the medium of podcasting to share about my experience with death and dying with my father. I trust and I believe that there's somebody on the other side, hopefully you, that's getting something from this that's going to be meaningful to you. The podcast is a gift that I've now created, and there's some gift that you have that you've already created that maybe you need to reconnect to or that you've been wanting to create. Seize the day and bring your gifts forward because there's somebody that needs it. And love your people. And love your people, not only the immediate people in your life, but this is really a reminder to Love all the people around you. Love your community. Love the extended humanity of people who are different from you, who need you to use your voice to speak out on their behalf. Expand your circle. Open your arms. Grow your community of the people that you love. And... I'm also thinking about the power of a poem, which I'll put the link into, which another member in the Mother's Quest community shared with me when we were getting ready for my dad's memorial about the dash between the years from when you were born and when you die. You know, in our obituary or on the headstone, if you have one, it's those dates, your birth and your death that seem to take so much presence. But really, it's the dash that was everything that mattered in between. So pay attention to the dash, live your life to the fullest, live your version of an epic life. And I want to just close with the final question that I shared at my dad's celebration of life at the end that I share whenever I do my milestone hikes every year in February. And that I really try to hold daily this question from the Mary Oliver poem. 
What is it you want to do with your one wild and precious life? I hope that this conversation supports you in your journey, opens you to conversations and to being present in the midst of the reality of a death and dying, and that you are able to fully step into living your epic life. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for coming along with me on this episode of the Mother's Quest podcast. I hope this conversation sparked something that will help you live your epic life. If you'd like to get show notes and learn more about how to join the Mother's Quest community, visit mothersquest.com. And while you're there, I would love it if you would follow the prompts to subscribe, leave a review on Apple Podcasts, and help us to spread the word. I want to end with some words to help light the way on your quest. Seize the day, love your people, honor your gifts. Until next time.